I am now going to discuss the mystery of the general epistles for spiritual dispensationalism. The mystery of the general epistles is that Bible-believing dispensationalists, and only they do, you'll notice that hyper-dispensationalists, or those who are not really into dispensationalism, they do not know this teaching, that there's a double application in the general epistles. In other words, we believe that you can find Christian doctrine in the general epistles, but you can also find tribulation Jewish doctrine in the general epistles. You might say, does that work that way? Yeah, it works that way. You're going to find out that with spiritual dispensationalism, the application should be very possible. Why? Because fresh review within spiritual dispensationalism, it argues for the need of double application in scripture. Now, when you read the Bible, if you think that there is a single application, then you know that you are wrong. The evidence is messianic prophecies, correct? The evidence is the tons of scripture verses that we looked at, that you cannot take this one verse as one application. We've seen Paul quoting Old Testament verses. But if you look at that Old Testament verse that he's quoting, it's a Jewish application or a tribulation Jewish application at times. However, you're going to find out that when Paul uses it, he uses it as a Christian application. So this tribulation Jewish application and Christian application, double application within verses is a matter of fact truth. And this is definitely the case with the general epistles. So let's explore this topic concerning the general epistles. Now this is going to be covering the academic realm, the theological realm, and dispensational and scriptural realms. So we're going to combine basically everything together for the general epistles. So y'all follow along with me and make sure you rewind and recall everything that we talked about before. This is why I'm putting this as last. Remember, historical criticism is by the unbelieving crowd. When they look at the scriptures, when they look at the general epistles, they see apocalyptic Jewish writings. So when they look at the general epistles, when they look at the four gospels, they see apocalyptic Jewish writing. So they say that Jesus is actually based off of a Jewish cult, kind of like Essenes with their Dead Sea Scrolls or other Jewish cults during that historical time period. So they argue that Jesus was just like one of these many fringe cults and he founded his own religion and it's an apocalyptic Jewish religion. That's what they insist. Now that's historical. Why is it apocalyptic Jewish? Because when you look at the historical time period, the Jews were expecting an apocalyptic times. They were anticipating end times. And there were different branches of movements coming out. Also, when you look at the writings, you can see apocalyptic Judaism. It, there's a lot of apocalyptic Jewish writing. So let's look at Matthew 24, for example. Matthew 24. When people tell you, and Christians, this is why they're so ignorant-minded, they think that everything is Christian. That's not true when you look at the wording here. So when you look at the wording here, Matthew chapter 24, for example, notice in verse 3, And as he sat upon the Mount of Olives, the disciples came unto him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? And what shall be the sign of thy coming and of the end of the world? See that? And then notice Jews right here, Jewish. If you look at Matthew chapter 24 and verse 20, verse 20, 
But pray that your flight be not in the winter, neither on the Sabbath day. Look at verse 16, verse 16. Then let them which be in where? Judea flee into the mountains. This is all Jewish wording here. And it's apocalyptic. If you read James, for example, now keep your hand at Matthew 24. We're going to kind of, we might return here, okay? Keep your hand at Matthew 24. And now I want you to go to James chapter 1. James chapter 1, verse 1. Notice that James, he is writing not to the Christian church, but to the 12 tribes of Israel scattered abroad. So what we deem to be Christianity is not actually the Christianity that Jesus and the apostles practice. Well, what is this Christianity? Well, according to Bart Ehrman, because obviously he's a fine authority and he's never wrong, and he'll admit that he's never wrong, you know. Paul is the one who messed everything up. And Paul is where he magnified the Christian doctrine. This is where we get our Christianity from. And then Constantine and the Catholic Church really made things worse. So where Jesus is God, that was taught because of Paul, who gave indications of it, and then Constantine and then the Catholics uh, took advantage of that. And that's why some dumb Bible believers out there who used to be Bible believers, they no longer believe Jesus is God. Oh, wow. Why? Because they, they're such amateurs. Yeah. They didn't even go to the university that I went to. This is already taught. So I already knew all this stuff. So these amateurish young punks of Bible believers who, who want to know more than their Bible-believing pastors and profess they do, they don't even scratch the surface. That's right. <laughs> Some of them don't even have a successful relationship. They're just that awkward and weird. But anyway, so this is the kind of stuff that is from historical criticism. And it is valid. There is some validity here. But they don't know the whole truth. They're just getting there. Okay, now theological hermeneutics. These are the guys who are going to save the day because they spiritualize everything. <laughs> So then they spiritualize the verses. Well, the verse don't really mean that way. What they see as contradictions, right? You notice from historical criticism, it's contradictions, differences. So they think it's different authors. Theological hermeneutics, they have to harmonize everything, make everything the same. In order to make everything the same, they can only spiritualize it. So when we look at James chapter 2, for example, and verse 24, James 2, 24, notice, ye see then how that by works a man is justified and not by faith only. Notice that this is not Christian salvation. This is a Jewish reference of salvation that is apocalyptic as well because chapter 5, verse 3 chapter 5, verse 3. Notice it says last days, right? Amen. If your hand is at Matthew 24, what's the famous passage about people talking about salvation? Matthew 24, 13, right? Remember, Matthew 24 is apocalyptic Jewish reference. And then verse 13 says, but he that endure unto the end, the same shall be saved. Well, that contradicts Paul. So these guys aren't incorrect. Notice what Paul said. I mean, this is a total contradiction. Look at Romans 4. Romans chapter 4. Very, very plain here. Verse 4 and 5. 4 and 5. Amen. Come on. Paul says that when you are saved by faith, there is absolutely not a single work involved. But James and Matthew pointed out that there are works involved. Romans 4, verse 4. Now to him that worketh is a reward not reckoned of grace, but of debt. See, you're not saved by grace then if you're going to work. Verse 5. But to him that worketh not, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Amen. That's all accounts for salvation. 
Theological hermeneutics, they want to attack historical criticism because they don't see differences, they harmonize. The only thing that can harmonize everything is God as the single author, right? right. So we believe in a single author God. These people think that God is created or made up. Hence, they insist multiple authors. So to help out God and believing that, no, this is all written by, this is all from the same word of God. God is the author using human instruments to write out his words. But they all contradict. So a historical criticism is very, is very attractive to believe in. However, you and I know that from theological hermeneutics, there is a system. And that system is from systematic theology. Yeah. Systematic theology, they have a branch from them called dispensationalism. That's the harmony there. Now, theological hermeneutics and all other methods from theology, they're going to teach this, which is a false teaching, because they want to spiritualize everything. So how am I going to harmonize James 2 and Romans 4? Bart Ehrman is very simple. A historical criticism will be very simple. That it was apocalyptic Jewish. That was their belief of their God. That it's faith and works for salvation, because the end is coming. Paul, he... He was the one who gave us the Christianity today and insisted no works involved. It's just faith in Jesus Christ. Well, obviously, you and I as saved believers don't believe the historical critics. We know that these authors aren't making up their own Jesus, their own God. They were all used by inspiration of God. God was the single author using all of them. So theological hermeneutics to help out God, they're going to harmonize somehow the verses by spiritualizing them, right? So they're going to insist that Romans 4, 4 and 5, that yes, it is a salvation by faith and not by works, but if you really have saving faith, then it's going to work. See, see that clever, clever talk? That's, that's why unbelievers, they don't fall for Christianity. They're very dishonest. If you look at these debates, these Christians, they use these hermeneutical tools, semantics. And then if you honestly watch Bart Ehrman and some of these Christians when they debate verses, you can tell that atheists get turned off by them. Yeah, that's right. Muslims get turned off by them. Why? Because the Christians are being dishonest. That's not how you're going to justify it. Read the verse as it says. Right. There's a different salvation here. Yeah. But if we believe in the same author, then the best answer is not any method from theological hermeneutics, but only dispensationalism. Why? Dispensationalism harmonizes the verses by recognizing differences. So, as I pointed out before, in this chart, you s there are four time periods I roughly write. That way it's easier for everybody. But there's Old Testament, there's Church Age, which is where you and I are at. There's the tribulation and the millennium. Lots of verses that you find that talk about faith and works for salvation for Jews, they could be Old Testament, they could be tribulation, they could be at the millennial kingdom when the Jews have their literal physical kingdom back. Faith without works for salvation is simply church age. So the answer is very simple. This is where you can put Paul's writing right here, the church age, because he's writing about the church. Paul was given the mystery of the church that other apostles and prophets, they weren't able to receive. If you go to Romans 16, Romans chapter 16. Now we know this, the Jews under the Old Testament they had to do faith and works for salvation. Then Jesus died on the cross.
but the Jews rejected their Messiah. So God was switching from Jew to Gentile. Amen. The Jews during this time, they were bound by a Jewish system. There were too many verses in the Old Testament talking about Jesus coming back as the Messiah, setting up a kingdom, restoring their nation, and that the end was coming. That was during Jesus' time. They were anticipating any moment. But you know what they did? They rejected it. So because of that, God had to postpone it 2,000 years. So you'll notice right here, this purple is the nation of Israel. See that? During this time, they were going to receive it, but they rejected it. So now God postponed it for the tribulation. What is now in this time period? It is the church age, also known as body of Christ. Gentiles were the ones receiving it. So it was switching from Jew to Gentile. Jew to Gentile. There was a transition here. This transition is the answer for all books in your New Testament. So if you go from Matthew through Acts, Hebrews through Revelation, these are transitional books that go from Jew to Gentile, you'll notice. And that's why there's a double application of Christian church age doctrine with tribulation Jewish doctrine. Double application there. Because God was transitioning from Jew to Gentile. That's what dispensationalism teaches. Do you, do you realize right here how this harmonizes the differences because they're right historical critics it's apocalyptic jewish paul gives a christian flavor why is that there's a historical point that they overlooked because they don't recognize the one true god see That's right. the one if they believed in the one true god then it would make sense the one true god he was preparing an apocalyptic jewish thing but then because the Jews rejected it, it switched to Gentile. So Paul, since his ministry was to Gentile, he gave them church age doctrine, not the apocalyptic Jewish doctrine. Paul gave them Christian doctrine, not the tribulation end time doctrine to the nation of Israel. That's the historical part historical critics didn't tell you. See, they just think that it's from a bunch of cultic Jews and then Gentiles just happen to pick up on that. No, if they put God into the picture, it's more so of God dealing with Jews, but he was transitioning to Gentiles because Gentiles were being more receptive. Why is there this mingling of apocalyptic Jewish and Christian? Why did God do that? Because the reason why was God was trying to give the Jews chance after chance. Right. But every time they rejected him, he was fading. And because the Gentiles were being more receptive, he was gradually turning more toward them. That's why there's this mingling. See, that makes historically a lot of sense. Right. This also makes a lot of sense why God, in his words, he gave this double application. It historically makes sense. It makes sense with God. Romans 16 points out that Paul was revealed the Christian mystery. In verse 25, Romans 16, 25, Now to him that is of power to establish you according to my gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which was kept secret since the world began, but now is made manifest, and by the scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the everlasting God, made known to all nations for the obedience of faith. Amen. Notice right here that at verse 25, Paul called it my gospel. Yes. Why did he call the Christian gospel my gospel? He didn't say, this is the gospel Peter and then the other apostle shared. No, this is mine. That's right. Well, Bart is right, I guess, right? Paul made up his own Christianity. He made up his own cult. Or... If God is real and dispensationalism is true, God revealed the mystery of the Christian gospel to Paul, yeah. not to the other apostles. 
That makes a lot of sense, doesn't it? Recognizing and realizing that Paul was revealed this mystery, now we come across some problems with mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists. So now that's another extreme you want to avoid. Why do we have to be careful of them? Because mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists, they'll take dispensationalism. I mean, isn't dispensationalism the right method? So what is wrong with going, simply going by dispensationalism. Because mid acts hyper, they, they realized how invaluable this method is. So they stick to this. Now look at this picture here, okay? Because they stick to this, what they're going to insist is this. Because Paul was the one who's clearly given the Christian gospel, it makes sense that it's only Paul's writing that are Christian, Romans to Philemon. Now, we agree with them, Romans to Philemon are only Christian doctrine, church age doctrine. But here's where they stretch it. This is where they get hyper. Hence, Matthew to Acts, Hebrews to Revelation, it means absolutely no Christian doctrine. They're going to make everything a Jew. That's what they're going to do. Now, look at this. Uh, let's look at some examples here. John chapter 3. We're going to go to John chapter 3. The famous passage about the Christian gospel we give, being born again, Jesus Christ who died on the cross, save us from hell. Now, look at this. John chapter 3 and verse 3. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said unto him, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Well, because it's not Paul's writing, hyper-dispensationalists will insist, oh, that's got to be tribulation Jew. So they make Matthew to Acts, Hebrews to Revelation, all tribulation Jew. And they're going to say that this is the nation of Israel being reborn at the millennium. It has nothing to do with the Christian new birth. Well, they got a problem because if you look at verse 16, what's the context? 16. For God so loved Israel that he gave his only begotten son, that if a Jew, any Jew believe in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Did I read that right? No. Any individual. Jesus, when he died, he died for the whole world. That if anyone believed on him, See that? Christian salvation by faith there. Then they would be saved. That ain't just Jew. That's anybody. So if he says whosoever, that's individual. Not a nation. That's not national. That's individual. Then when you rewind back to John 3, 3, Verily, verily, I say unto thee, except a nation be born again. The Jew cannot see the kingdom of God? No. A man. Individual. This is Christian gospel right here. You can't deny that. But you notice mid-acts hyper-dispensationalists will switch that to a Jewish context or a national context, not individual. Why are they wrong? The reason why they're wrong is because they, for, there's a small thing they neglected. Remember? The small thing that they neglected is the transition here. That's what they failed to recognize. Hyper-dispensationalists do not recognize transition. Historically, God was moving from Jew to Gentile. So because he was moving from tri tribulation Jew, or the nation of Israel, to the body of Christ, to the Christian church, that's why we're going to find double application in these books. So remember this. This is not just Jew. This is Jew to Gentile, okay? So this is, notice right here, body of Christ and nation of Israel. Let me... draw this out. Okay. You notice this connection right here? 
how the nation of Israel, God is dealing with them, but they're fading out. And then notice the church age is fading in. You notice that there? That was that transitional time period. All of this transitional time period here. Let's see. Let's draw it this way. And then when we get to here, it's all blue. No purple here. You notice that? This is all church age. But here, it's fading. You notice that transition? Don't miss out the transition here. These are called transitional epistles. Schofield called it correctly Jewish Christian epistles. It's transitional. Meaning what? Double application. You notice mid-Acts, they single application. They say that Matthew through Acts, Hebrews through Revelation is only tribulation Jewish. Baloney, baloney. You're going to find Christian church age doctrine. You will find Christian church age doctrine within those writings as well. That's what mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists overlook. Is this, his, this is a historical point of view. It made sense, correct? You can see it makes sense theologically as well. So historically it makes sense. It was switching from Jew to Gentile. No one will deny that. That's history. Secondly, theologically it makes sense. God was giving up on the Jews and turning to Gentiles. We also saw scripturally we saw from the scriptures how that these verses, they match with Christian church age, but also how these verses match with tribulation Jew. So there's no denying to this. Now there's another problem with the hyper-dispensationalists. The key method that they overlook is spiritual dispensationalism. So when we come from theological hermeneutics, dispensationalism prides in taking the historical literal approach in a theological format that harmonizes but what I want to argue and insist a lot of people don't add this what a lot of people don't add is or they don't recognize remember the history here dispensationalism is from this spiritualization method that's academically speaking you notice that? It was theological hermeneutics. Their tool is to spiritualize, which is to harmonize the verses through systematic theology. The branch that comes out of it is dispensationalism. And then out of this came out mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalism, the heresy. Because it's born from the spiritualization method, we cannot neglect that. Recall that historical criticism recognizes that this spiritualization is important. Remember that the problem with theological hermeneutics with their spiritualization is that they allegorize everything, right? They ignore the historical, literal meaning of the verses. The verse means as it says. That's what it means. But just because it means as it says doesn't mean that it has or that it lacks spiritual meaning to you. Remember that? That's the key of theological hermeneutics. The key of theological hermeneutics is that they recognize that verse, no matter what time period it's in, it has spiritual meaning to you. The easy example, and I gave you some examples before, is pastors today. Pastors today can pull up any verse from the Bible and preach a message. And they will preach the message not because if they were going to preach from an Old Testament passage like, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. One of the Ten Commandments from Exodus 20. We know that historically, literally, that was for the Jews in the Old Testament, not Christians in the New Testament. But does that mean that we won't find spiritual meaning out of that verse? No, of course we can find spiritual meaning out of it. What we can learn out of that is, Hey, God doesn't want anything that's higher than him. And don't you think that's spiritually important to you? That's spiritually meaningful to you? That 
is the answer that historical criticism scholars realize that it doesn't make sense that when you just apply these things historically to the past, that all of a sudden it has no application for you in the future. See, the historical criticism scholars realize when these authors were writing, they intended it to be applied to their readers. That the readers will take spiritual meaning, spiritual lessons out of it. Paul even, remember, Paul even recognized that when he wrote about the Old Testament. The Old Testament, they were written aforetime for our learning. And that spiritual rock was Christ. Remember that? So Paul argued that even from an Old Testament passage, he got spiritual meaning out of it. And that's what the audience can learn from that. Historical criticism recognize there is no doubt when these authors were writing, literally in their historical time period, they intended for their audience, for their readers, to gain spiritual meaning out of it. Not just the first centuries and then it has no application later on. No, these authors wrote down that it was intended for all time. That's the spiritual meaning that is necessary. And you and I know, I know as Christians that this whole Bible, God intended it for all time. He intended all 66 books to be in our hand so that we can learn out of it. We can spiritually change our lives. Not to just assume that, oh, historically that was Old Testament back at that time period, so it has no application to me. No. Not oh, that has historical application to future tribulation, so I can't learn anything out of it. That doesn't apply to me. No. Now, mid-Acts hypers, they act like Calvinists, and I'm sick and tired of that, all right? I don't care what you comment over here. You guys are all the same. And what they'll do is, no, that's, we don't teach that. No, we, we believe that you can get spiritual lessons out of it, that you can, get, you can learn something from the Old Testament and other books of the Bible. Well, if they believe in that... Here's the problem that they don't recognize. With this spiritual application, we argue also doctrinal. That's right. This spiritual application includes doctrinal application. Amen. And that's where the hypers will go, no, no, I don't believe in that. <laughs> so let's review the spiritualization. All right, fresh review. What happened? What happened was, you notice on this journey, we explain how historical critics look, looked at the Bible. And they're getting there, but not quite. Theological hermeneutics, they try to harmonize everything in the Bible, but they're not quite there because they just keep spiritualizing. In other words, they allegorize the whole verses. They can't even use this spiritualizing correctly. But dispensationalism from theological hermeneutics was able to successfully bridge these two together. They were able to bridge these two together. They were able to harmonize all the verses while recognizing the historical differences. But there's just one step that it's missing that they need to add on. They need to realize that they come from this spiritualization method. So they need to emphasize the spiritualization method more. And this spiritualization method is what makes us different from the mid-axe hyper-dispensationalists. It's only this. Do you understand that? Only this and this alone. Without this, then we, we're not much different from them. We have no basis to prove that we're different from them. Without this tool, then how are we going to insist that we're different from them? I'd like to ask you. How are you going to do it? You can't really do it. The only way you can do it is through the spiritualization tool. The spiritualization tool, what does it consist of? Doctrinal, allegorical, historical, literal, and everything that we've learned in our last study. Remember that? So let's take this example then. The example that we can understand this spiritualization, let's now apply it through to authorial intention, the author's intention. What was in the mind of the authors when they were writing all that? What 
what do you mean by authorial intention or the intention of the authors? So this is the problem with anti-dispensationalists or with uh, hyper-dispensationalists or those who are weak in dispensationalism. In the authorial intention, the idea is this. Here is the author. I'm the author. And here I am writing 1 John. And I'm writing 1 John. And sure, we can argue, Bible-believing dispensationalists can argue that the book of 1 John is double application. It consists of tribulation, Jewish doctrine, and Christian doctrine. But that doesn't make sense if we're going to be totally honest. If the author's writing, how is his audience going to tell, okay, that verse is tribulation Jew, that verse is Christian. That verse is tribulation Jew, that verse is Christian. And by the way, it doesn't make sense if the author is writing about tribulation Jewish doctrine, you can lose your salvation. So faith is not enough. You have to have works out of it. But then he writes, no, salvation is by faith, and you are secured to the end. You see this? It doesn't make sense then. So the authorial intention doesn't make sense, which is why people do not believe in this double application, because it doesn't just make sense with the author. So those who are weak dispensationalists or anti-dispensationalists, they'll insist that, well, these books are written to first century Christians. Matthew to Acts, Hebrews to Revelation, Romans to Philemon. Well, what about losing your salvation? What about works with your faith for your salvation? Guess what the denominations will do? They'll teach that then. See, that's why there are so many churches that, that deny eternal security. Because that's what they think Christian doctrine is. Because they think Matthew through Acts, Hebrews to Revelation are all Christian writings. They deny, they deny any tribulation Jewish application. And since this is all Christian writing, so if the verse says endure to the end, if the verse says faith without works is dead, if the verse says that um, uh, you have to keep perfecting yourselves, it, the just shall live by faith, but if, my soul, uh, but if the soul draws, uh, but if any man draws back, my soul shall, uh, then he is doomed for perdition. So there are so many of those verses. What are we going to do then? That doesn't make sense. Because <laughs> that plainly contradicts Paul's writing. Paul's writing says, no, you don't lose your salvation. Paul insists that uh, once saved, always saved. And by the way, even some of these writings here yeah. mention that too. Yes. So that won't make sense. Then you get uh, other people who will try to insist, and they try to go around it by saying, well, you know, uh, we do believe that you cannot lose your salvation. One saved, always saved. Salvation by faith, not by works. However, when John is talking about, and James is talking about works, that's just a typical sign of a saved believer. <laughs> that's how they'll get around that. You see that? That's that hermeneutic, spiritualizing thing, making up words. No, read the verse as it says. It says that you are saved by faith and works. And if it says faith and, saved by faith and works, that's what the verse says. Don't try to put your own meaning in there. That's, what, that's that theologic hermeneutic stuff that's very dishonest. Yeah. You don't want to do that. The historical critic, it makes sense. There is a difference there. They see faith and work because that's what it says, and they see faith not by works. That's what it says. That's when you look at the wording. These guys are more honest than these theologians here. Then there are those who are mid-Acts hyper-dispensationalists. Well, you know, simple. Matthew through Acts, Hebrews through Revelation is all tribulation Jewish doctrine. That's what it is. But what are you going to do with verses, like I've demonstrated to you before, that match with Paul's writing that are clearly Christian? See, both parties are dishonest. The most, forget authorial intention, okay? You want to be honest when you read the verse. The verse shows a mingling or two things. I see Christian church and I see apocalyptic Jewish. That's just being very honest there. But the problem now is how do we reconcile with authorial intention? Remember, the thing that can reconcile, that can harmonize is this guy, theological hermeneutics. 
Dispensationalism's job is to harmonize. And they forgot that tool, spiritualizing. Well, what do you mean by that, Pastor? Does that mean that you have to reinterpret the verses and say what it means rather than exactly what it says? No, 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 no. Remember, spiritualizing is not just showing the meaning, allegorical interpretation. It's doctrinal. It's uh, historical, literal, and all those other goodies that I've demonstrated before. So let's see how this can operate with authorial intention. So there are three ways that you can do this, which is pretty simple. The first thing to keep in mind, and what is very important, is that the authors do not know everything. That's right. That is very important. They did not know everything. Well, when they were writing that, that verse or these words, they intended something. Correct. But this is what they forget historically. Historically, authors, they, where did they get that knowledge from? They didn't get that knowledge from themselves. Who did they get it from? They got it from the Holy Spirit. They got it from Jesus. So what they did was they took the best according to what they perceived, their knowledge from what Jesus taught them, and wrote the word the best way that they can intend it. So what they gave was to the best of their knowledge what they were taught by Jesus, what they were taught by the Holy Spirit. What that means is they still lack knowledge because they were giving to the best of their knowledge, meaning that they didn't know 100% everything. So that's historical fact, okay? Even forgetting Christianity and everything, let's just go by historical fact. We can agree that these apostles just wrote to the best of their knowledge. So the authors lack knowledge. They only wrote to the best of their knowledge. Number two, let's go by several cases. One, the authors, this is very important. Historic dividing, rightly dividing. Now let me ask you this question. If you're rightly dividing the Bible, we're more hyper than a hyper dispensationalist. Ready for this? We're more real in dividing verses than they are. You ready for this? They chop off Matthew through Acts, Hebrews to Revelation like it's a clean thing. No, each of these authors were all in different time periods. How do you not know? Check this out. That uh, let's put it right here. Hebrews through James is more tribulation Jewish flavor. So TJ, okay? When you look at 1 Peter through Jude, it's more Christian in flavor. And if you go through Matthew, through Mark, it's more tribulation Jew in flavor. And then if you go through Luke, through John, it's more Christian in flavor. Now, how many got lost after that, right? <laughs> See that? That's a lot more work in rightly dividing. Right. Now, why do I say it that way? The ones who will understand, believe it or not, you get this. Do you know who's going to get this the most? Historical criticism. You know why? They're not harmonizing verses. They're literally looking at every word in the verse and dividing it to different time periods because they think multiple authors wrote it. Only those guys are going to get this because they're going, to, they're going to believe that when you're reading, let's say, the book of Isaiah, not everything is written by one author Isaiah. 
They're going to say that it was written by multiple authors. That's the historical critic's understanding. Now, they're on to something. We, we reject the unbelieving mindset about multiple authors. We believe that, the, that Paul did write those epistles. Isaiah wrote Isaiah, etc. Okay, that's where we're different. But they have a point here. The point that they make is when you look at every word and verse, it is very different hint, very different flavor. You can see a Jewish flavor here. You can see a Christian flavor here. You can see an Old Testament flavor here. You can see an apocalyptic flavor there. Do you understand? What is that? Literally looking at every word, tone, language, context of the verse. Not just amateurishly thinking, well, because Paul wrote, uh, Paul wrote the book of Hebrews, and because of that, it's going to be all Christian. No, look at the verse. Look at every word, the tone, the language, context. You can see apocalyptic Jewish flavor with Christian. You're going to see those differences there. If you're going to be totally honest when you inspect the words. This is what? Honest inspection of the word of God. That's right. Very honest inspection. So let's assume that these are the divisions. If one want to insist that this is more tribulation Jewish for 1 Peter through Jude, if somebody wants to argue that uh, Luke through John is more tribulation flavor, uh, me, I have no qualms with that. There's, that's no problem with me, all right? But the point is, what I mean by Hebrews to James is more tribulation Jewish, 1 Peter through Jude is more Christian, meaning that it leans more toward these, but it won't neglect the other application. So just because Hebrews through James is more tribulation Jewish, it doesn't neglect the Christian application, the Christian flavor as well. 1 Peter through Jude is more Christian in flavor, but it won't neglect the tribulation flavor as well. All right, do we follow so far? Like I told you, this is very deep. I'm trying to really break it down as easy as I can. Now, get this. This might be eye-opening to you. Let's assume Peter through Jude, they were writing Christian doctrine. They were writing Christian doctrine for the Christian churches. But what are you going to do with that other application that's tribulation Jewish? What are you going to do with that? That's where spiritual dispensationalism comes in. Those authors might have intended, so that's number three, all right? Oh boy, I'm running out of room. Da, 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 da. Okay. The author might intend one way, but the ultimate author intended it for another. Versus God's intention. So where Jude might be writing about Christian doctrine in that verse, God might say, well, that can work for Christian doctrine, but I also can see this can work for tribulation Jew. See that? Why can God do that? Because... Look at several easy scriptural examples. Remember the Messianic prophecies? Hosea mentioned, out of Egypt have I called my son Israel out. That's what Hosea, the author, intended. But God, he says, yeah, you're right, that can talk about Israel. But I also see yes. as a Messianic prophecy about my son being out of Egypt. And that's what Matthew wrote. Remember, he used the book, that verse in Hosea as a prophecy of Jesus Christ leaving Egypt. That's what's going on in the general epistles. But how can God, how can we insist that? How can we argue that? That when the author wrote it one way, God intended it for multiple time periods, multiple groups of people. What's the only operation? What's the only basis that gives validity for that? Only a spiritual operation. Not historically. Hosea didn't write about Jesus when he wrote that historically. Yeah. David, when uh, 
it is very, uh, it is very plausible when he said, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He didn't mean Jesus historically. He was talking about himself in woe and sorrow. But spiritually, when David wrote those words, the Holy Spirit was in that, and he said, that will be a prophecy about my son Jesus Christ. When he cries out, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? See that? If that is the case with messianic prophecies and many other verses that you can find in the Bible, why do we, why do we say that that can't apply to general epistles? This is a basis that it's a, it's a, no matter what Christian denomination you are, they don't realize this. They are closet dispensationalists who believe in double application. If they deny it and they say they don't believe in it, then they should reject Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Come on. Why? Because all, nearly majority of messianic verses, they're double application. Yeah. They're not single. They're not historically application either. You can only make it a fulfillment of Jesus Christ because the Holy Spirit inspired those authors when they wrote it about Jesus Christ from the Old Testament. See, that spiritual basis, that spiritual operation. So that's what's going on right here. God did the same thing. Now, some might accuse us, well, you're just making that up, that the verse is tribulation Jewish, and then the other verse is Christian church age doctrine. I mean, I could apply that to Old Testament for all you know. I could apply that to Mickey Mouse and Disneyland, and you're just throwing in different groups of people, different time periods. No. Remember, what is the basis, the boundary, the authority for spiritual interpretation? That was the problem with theological hermeneutics, right? They just throw out spiritual interpretations however way they want to. Remember, what is the only basis why we can do this spiritual application? Y'all remember? Scripture with Scripture. So when you compare Scripture with Scripture, let's just go back here, okay? No, this is so simple, okay? This is so simple. When we go to 1 John, let's go to 1 John. This is a great case. Let's do Scripture with Scripture, okay? When we do scripture with scripture, it gives justification. It gives justification to this double application. We're just not making stuff up. It's because we're comparing scripture with scripture and it just makes sense. Let's start off with 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 24. 1 John 2, 24. The Bible says, Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If, see that condition? That which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. So notice the basis of being in Jesus Christ is based on an if. If you abide in Jesus Christ, if you remain in Him, if you abide in what you've heard about Jesus Christ. Now notice the wording here, how it matches with Hebrews chapter 3. Hebrews chapter 3. This if that abides. Look at Hebrews chapter 3. And then verse 16. So if you look at this whiteboard, I'm going to, uh, let me move here so all can see. So let's assume, see this? It's Christian, right? John is writing to Christians. So let's say this is, he intended it for the audience to be Christian. But notice the wording of that verse is going to match with tribulation Jew. So let's say historically he was writing to first century Christians. That's a historical application for John. Well, let's look at how it matches historically with Hebrews, which is tribulation Jewish. So that book is historically tribulation Jewish. Notice it matches the wording of that. So in Hebrews chapter 3, verse 6, chapter 3 and verse 6. But Christ as a son over his own house, whose house are we, if we hold fast the confidence and the rejoicing of the hope firm unto the end. See that? But uh, let's compare that now. 
with Hebrews 3.14. Hebrews 3.14, verse 14. For we are made partakers of Christ if we hold the beginning of our confidence. Did you notice that? That's similar with 1 John 2.24. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, you continue in the Son. See that? There's that endurance, that holding on. See the language of the wording here? Now, let's look at chapter 10, verse 26. Chapter 10, verse 26. The, I don't care what you say, all right? This ain't Christian salvation. Look at this, Hebrews 10, 26. For if we sin willfully, after that we have received the knowledge of the truth, Remember what John said? What you heard from the beginning about the Son, right? So once you receive, once you hear that, John says you are to abide in it. Hebrews 3 said you're supposed to hold that fast. Hebrews and John said hold it to the, from the beginning, right? Stay there from the beginning. Well, how many of you have sinned willfully after you received the knowledge of the truth, after you've heard it? All right, all of you did, all right? The last part of verse 26 says, There remaineth no more sacrifice for sins, but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. That's hellfire. Yeah. See that there? In this case and example, we've done scripture with scripture. And that's why we say right here when John even though historically he was writing to a first century Christian audience, the wording right there matched with what? A tribulation Jewish epistle. So because of that, we cannot deny a tribulation Jewish hint within that epistle of John. Even if it's historically written to Christians, he wrote it to a Christian audience. When you look at the wording, you can't deny tribulation Jewish hints or wordings there. See that? So what's the answer? The answer is, here is John writing to a first century Christian audience. And, but God, he saw when John was writing those words, that fits well with the tribulation Jew. There's your answer there. So then, now we get more into the author's intention, right? Then the next question is, what was John thinking when he wrote that? Like I said, the important thing is, we don't know, because they were just going by the best of their knowledge. But here's the case right here that we can get. If we understand this, let's assume this is the historical application, and I think this is the most accurate, to be honest, okay? Maybe I'm just a couple books off. But historically, it just makes sense. When you read the whole book of Hebrews to James, hardly Christian, too much apocalyptic Jewish references. James said 12 tribes of Israel. He said last days, Hebrews is for Hebrews, right? And Hebrews mentioned the things to come whereof we speak, the world to come whereof we speak. So he said tribulation right there. When you read uh, the book of Matthew and then through Mark, there's too much uh, tribulation reference. We saw Matthew 24, right? Tribulation, Jewish reference. He talked about kingdom of heaven. That kingdom of heaven ain't Christians going to heaven. That kingdom of heaven was a messianic kingdom that the Jews were waiting for. So there's so much of Jewish references over there. When you look at 1 Peter through Jude, we could say, and we could probably say, that this is Christian doctrine. John, he talks a lot about eternal life, eternal security. He talks about a fellowship of the Christian walk. Uh, we see uh, Peter talking about the new birth, and then reservation made in heaven, faith. Jude talked similar things. He said, all of us share the common salvation whereof we preach. So that doesn't sound tribulation Jewish to me. It would sound more Christian. Luke, he's a Gentile author. So it makes sense that there will be more Gentile flavor of writing. And what is more Gentile? Is it the Jewish nation or the church? It's the church, right? So we can guess, obviously, church. John, we saw from John 3, and there's so many verses in John about believing, believing, believing. That's Christian. That's Christian. So this is just by honestly going by a historical approach. 
And if we were to say that the author, from his historical perspective, this would make the most sense, OK? Now, understanding this historical application, John was, let's say, writing historically to first century Christians. And these verses, maybe he was talking about the signs of a true believer. So a saved Christian, these are the normal things that they would do. However, God, he sees that this fits with tribulation Jewish doctrine. So spiritually, God sees this as tribulation Jewish application. That's spiritually. Historically, John would see this as first century Christian. Well, why can't we just say first century Christian, the signs of a true believer? Because the wording of the verses, yeah. spiritual things with spiritual, scripture with scripture, doesn't separate tribulation Jew, if you're going to be totally honest. So perhaps, let's see right here. So the author's intention is different from uh, God's intention. Notice this historical and spiritual. Let me add this. Here we go with the Jews. Look at this historical time period. The Jews, they rejected their Messiah. Jesus Christ, he gave a lot of apocalyptic Jewish references. This was their chance. All right, Jews, here's the tribulation's going to come. Your messianic kingdom's going to come. Faith and works for salvation. Your nation will be restored if you would receive me. And Jesus preached that, he taught that, and here is the Apostle John who hears all of that. Then the Jews were rejecting their Messiah, it's turning to Gentile. And then the Apostle Paul comes in. And the Apostle Paul, he comes in, and then he gives a mystery of the body of Christ. Christian salvation, eternal security. And here is John. He was taught by Jesus Christ about apocalyptic Jewish tribulation references. And now, here he has Paul's writings, Paul's churches and believers that are spread out, talking about Christian doctrine, Christian belief. So now John, he switches to Christian doctrine and teaches Christian doctrine. However, because he was trained by Jesus Christ, the certain tones and the hints and the wordings where he was taught by Jesus Christ, where it was apocalyptic Jewish teachings, never left his personality and mind. And some of those wordings that were brought up from Jesus was mingled in with Paul's Christian teaching as he was writing out that epistle. See that there? So how do you not know that's what was going on? Because the nation of Israel and the body of Christ was simultaneously going that time. Authors, when they're writing to the best of their knowledge, they're writing from what they've learned from other teachers. And you know this to be true. When you learn from previous teachers, their wordings, their teachings are all mingled together in your own teaching and writings. That's a historical fact and truth. So let me repeat again. John, he might have been writing to first century Christians, talking about the signs of a true believer. But God, from a spiritual plane, sees that, that this will be tribulation Jewish doctrine. And God, he sees it, that can be Christian, that can be tribulation Jew. Oh, here's this one verse that can work well with both Christian church and tribulation Jew. That's how God sees his verses. His words when you're writing it down. And that is an indisputable fact in the Bible. It's impossible to have a single application method in verses. Of course, there are verses that are single application, but not every verse. And everybody will agree with that when we come to Messianic prophecies especially. So there is no doubt about that. Okay, so this is the teaching of the general epistles. I hope you all got a blessing. Amen. And that was very eye-opening. So, let's now take the example of 
Hebrews through James. So then here's Paul. He's writing the book of Hebrews. And he's talking about apocalyptic Jewish reference. Well, as he's writing that, historically, God, he could be seeing that, you're right, that works for tribulation Jew, but I can also see this works well and can apply to a Christian church as well. So spiritually, God sees different application, different groups of people. The author, the, all they see is a single approach in their historical time period from their historical understanding. Just like Isaiah, from his historical understanding, he writes it out about Israel being the nation that God rejected and then, the, uh, and then suffering beaten persecution, the Jewish saints, beard plucked off, hair plucked off, spitting upon. But when God saw that verse, he says, Isaiah, from your historical understanding, you might see that as a Jew, but I see this more than a Jew. I see the Jew of Jews. I see my son in that verse where his beard gets plucked off and then he, his face gets spitten upon. That's the spiritual application. All right. Hence, we end spiritual dispensationalism. I hope you all got a blessing. Heavenly Father, I pray that tonight's teaching was a blessing to the hearers, and we've learned a lot. We've increased our knowledge of the scriptures. We understand more of that book. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.